during the, uh, the course of their duties. So it addressed both misdemeanor assaults and the current arrest warrant requirement by doing away with the arrest warrant requirement to be done on probable cause, just like we can on domestic violence arrests. You go to a domestic violence incident, if you can determine the primary aggressor, you can effect an arrest without a warrant. It would say that a hospital environment is also a very sacred environment. It needs to be protected for many reasons. And if police officers can determine that someone needs to be taken away and the healthcare providers say, yes, we want this person away to be safe, then they can in fact do that without having to go back and get an arrest warrant. Thank you. By the way, I, I did uh, put a Google search similar to that. <clears throat> what came up was the Utah incident. Oh. And that's probably not what you had in mind. No. But, yeah, there, there's a number of incidents out there, yes. An Andrew Kitchenman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, it, for, I guess, for Representative Johnston, although I guess it could be for anyone, uh, do you feel that a appropriation bill is meaningful um, considering it would cover the entire next uh, budget year when when uh, we, we don't know what the funding source would be for the budget? Yes, because actually if you look at the fall revenue forecast, um, and and I appreciate that the state is conservative on their their revenue forecast, and I think um, I think the fall was at fifty four dollars a barrel. And and that has one point nine billion in it. Um, you know, it's, it, it fascinates me that we, as we go through this budget process, there's a, you can feel sort of this wave that folks are always then waiting for the spring revenue forecast. And that sometimes holds up the discussion. Um, but I will say with the fall forecast, that's $1.9 that is adequate to fund the education uh, formula program. So I, I think I think it's a great statement to the communities, um, and it is funded. Mm -hmm. We do have the funds. As a follow-up question, um, I mean the, the the state budget's over four billion dollars, the UGF. So uh, will you shut down everything else? I mean, you know. Um, at this point, we're saying that I would I would be very upset if we did that. Um, but the budget process needs to go go forward. I mean, I, I was confused by some of the discussions on the floor because first of all, they, there was a discussion that we had no funds, which isn't the case. We have funds, as I'm pretty sure we will have money in the bank July first, um, and uh, um, the budget process has always counted on funds available. Um, where, where, where I'm also confused is it seemed last year there was a big discussion about not drawing down the constitutional budget reserve, that we needed to keep a healthy balance and we shouldn't be using it um, because we need it for future, and then to take such a big draw out of it. So you might, you might have issues with cash flow management um, I, I, it confuses me. I'm not sure where the, I'm, I'm having trouble following the ball on that. Um, but I, I would, would be surprised if we don't have to take some draw from the Constitutional Budget Reserve. I just don't think it will have to be $1.2 billion, and I hope, I hope we get there. But you know, we've had a process, and I guess that's where, you know, if they want to do education, why didn't we do all of education? We could have done the Department of Education at the same time. We could have looked at the bond reimbursement. Um, our borough, when there was a cut in the bond reimbursement, they actually took money away from the school district as part of the monies that they normally give. So, you know, if it's all about them being able to set their budget, they still can't set their budget because they don't know all the revenue that's going to come in from the state. So, you know, we spent time outside of the process when we still have subcommittees on this side going on. You know, I'm not worried about whether or not there's going to be a shutdown or not because we're on track still to be able to have the budget by, you know, mid-March off the floor and over to the Senate. The question is, are we going to start doing one department at a time, and then are we going to prioritize all the departments, or at the end make, you know, whatever departments are left, fight it out? I don't think that's anybody's um, wish, but that's what happens when you start going outside the process. Uh, Tim Bradner, Legislative Digest. Representative Wilson, you made a remark earlier about the slow pace in the Finance Committee. Could you elaborate on that? Did, did you mention that the, that the uh, subcommittee work is slower 
this year that it has been last year? Oh, absolutely. I sit on corrections and public safety, and if we had just gone by the agenda that we were given, we were going to spend less than four hours on the Department of Corrections, which is the fastest growing budget that we have. In the budget, it even talks about opening Palmer back up. So what happened to all the good things that were supposed to happen with pretrial and, and, and make it to where things were going to be safer and we wouldn't have as many people into the prison and the health care portions of it? We're paying so much for that. But, you know, we have pressured them on having some more meetings, so we do have one on Saturday. But a lot of those things are policy calls. And look at finance. We were in the majority, we met in the morning and we met in the afternoon. And everything is just rushed when we do get there. We have three agencies in front of us. We're told at the very beginning, from this time to this time, it's this agency, then this agency, then this agency. Where do we have to go? I mean, we are here to do our job seven days a week. That's part of the 90 days. I just don't understand why we're not putting that kind of time into it. And then what we'll hear when we put the amendments forward, well, you should ask those things to the department. Well, you can't do that if you only have something like health and social services only in front of you for 45 minutes and you don't sit on the subcommittee. We've got a question online. Okay. She dropped off. <laughs> <laughs> to uh, switch gears somewhat, I wanted to ask about the supplemental budget issue, um, your thoughts on supplemental budgets in general. But uh, one of the things I'm trying to focus in on is figure out, do you believe that there is a problem with supplemental budgets, with, with the amounts, with the way things are going right now? And it's not just directed at Representative Wilson, but everyone else on the panel as well. Well, there's a huge issue with the supplemental, especially when you're looking at about $100 million in a Medicaid. They seem surprised that when they went out and put all this advertising for people to sign up for Medicaid expansion, if you looked at all the other states, what they found was there was a lot of people who could have been on Medicaid already. So instead of going into the 100% Medicaid expansion, they went into the 50-50 Medicaid because they had children and they had the income on that. And that's why we see a lot of the growth. But $100 million, we didn't take $100 million out of it on our side. So, you know, how did the governor or health and social services miss it by that much? And what are we going to do? Because we have some of the, we put a lot of extras into Medicaid. So in the Medicaid program also went to Medicaid expansion. Are we going to be able to keep affording what we're doing? But the other part is with the Medicaid expansion, it's supposed to be training. We're not having anybody come in and do training. Once you get onto it, we're trying to, we should as a state be helping you with a hand up, getting a better job so that you get better insurance and you keep moving up into it, not stuck onto a state program. But that part's not even being done by health and social services. We're just handing the checks out with no accountability to go along with it. Jennifer, do you want to come in on supplemental? Well, you know, to me there's also a bigger issue as far as supplemental is that um, I don't feel in our, in our budgeting and our financials we're very honest with it because it's embedded in our next year's base budget. And, and I think we need to, to be a little bit more transparent on how our budgets are built. Um, because I, I think that's that's a missing piece, and it's been a missing piece for a long time. Sure. I think the supplemental budget is a great question, James. We have, as you know, we've had a supplemental budget every year for, for decades. There are so many things that you can't foresee. Um, it could be that, you know, fuel spikes to over $5 a gallon. It, it could be that we have a road washout like we've had. It could be that DOT has a catastrophic incident with a dock or a ferry, or the ferry and the dock at the same time. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a number of things that drive supplemental budgets that we do expect to see. I think in the case of, of Medicaid, we are all for taking care of people that need to be taken care of. That's really not an issue. We are finding that, that eligibility determinations um, and verification of eligibility and re-verification are a very important safeguard of those dollars so that all the money is there that needs to be there for taking care of people that need it, but that we're not treating it like such an open checkbook that we're not that we're not wisely making sure that we're getting the money to the people that really need it. So I think what we're seeing now is a more focus on how do we keep costs down through not so much pushing people away but uh, that need it, but pushing people away who are abusing it. And, um, and I think that's a, that's a focus we should have with every public dollar, whether it's a federal dollar or whether it's a state dollar. 
But on that point, that's exactly right what Representative Kopp said. It was supposed to be for emergencies. And now what's happened is that we've had the, high, the highest supplementals with the governor we have than, than any, any other time. And it's because we're, we're acting like we're cutting the operating budget down and saving money and then putting it into a supplemental when it was supposed to be used, um, just like Representative Kopp says, for wildfires, for those things that um, happen and you just don't know what the costs are going to be, but not for everyday operating. Shouldn't be pat it shouldn't be padded to, to offset the operating budget so it looks like we have smaller budgets. And I think that we go back to the kind of truth in budgeting, you know, like Representative Kopp and Representative Wilson said, that that is an emergency fund for unexpected events, and now it's being used in a much different way than it had um, originally been designed for. It, just a, a one thing I'd like to comment on about Chief Justice Storrs. Uh, it, it was his last address, and... Um, he has been a great Chief Justice for our state. I hope we all paid attention to his uh, plea for upgrading the district court position here in Juneau to a superior court position. I believe the judiciary branch has really led the way in cost efficiencies. They've done a lot of things that have been really difficult for the court system, the employees, and ultimately, I mean, every Alaskan that interfaces with the justice system, I think, has felt that impact in, in some way. But they're doing their part, and I, I hope, and I believe uh, we all here at this table hope to see House Bill 298 um, pass right away. That would give Juno a superior court judge that can do not just misdemeanor and low-level criminal matters, but the more complex civil law matters and felonies that um, would uh, uh, greatly uh, improve the efficiency of the court system in this area. Andrew, did you have a question? Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Um, as far as the issue of truth, truth of budgeting, um, David Teal has said that the uh, Department of Health and Social Services had indicated last year that Medicaid expenses were likely to be at least somewhat higher than uh, was budgeted. So do you see the legislature bearing some of the responsibility for that issue? We can only go with the facts that they give us, and, and I know it's a shot in the dark, but I think that $100 million, that, that to me is a department issue. I can see that we would, you know, we, we expected something to come back because, again, when people are signing up, you don't know which program that they're going to sign up for, the expansion program or the, the regular program. So that was something the department doesn't know, but they should have known the trends. And we didn't spend hardly any time on it. Or SB 74 we passed a few years ago that was also supposed to help drive the cost down. Our biggest concern that we keep hearing about, and it is a concern, is, is our health cost. And it's a big driver, not just health and social services, but we also see it in our corrections where we pay 100% with state dollars. But unless we're willing to take time out, you know, into finance and, and drive down what's making those costs happen and whether or not, you know, we can bring those professionals here, then we're just going to keep saying the same thing year after year and we're going to see the general fund go up because we have no way of being able to get that done somewhere else. Anybody else? Well, thank you for being here. We'll be back next week at the same time and same place. Appreciate all of you being here and go out and enjoy some vitamin D while we have it. Thank you.